I was thinking it has been over 20 years since I moved to Savannah, Georgia, the first time, Savannah 1.0. Now I was thinking when I first moved down here to Savannah, I had moved from Canada all the way here to the deep and beautiful south. And for the first little while here in Savannah, people would come up to me after they'd hear me preach. They'd hear my funny sounding Canadian accent and they'd say, what part of Virginia you from? <laughs> and I'd say, the part they call Canada. <laughs> Some people would come up to me and they'd say, now, you're not from around here, are you, son? I didn't like them calling me son, but it was true. I was not from around here, although my great, 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 great grandfather's buried just on the other side of the border up there in South Carolina. No, I'm not from around here. And they'd say, well, boy, who are your people? Who, who my people? Yeah, who are your people? I said, well, my, my people are, you know, the, the Giulianos. They came from Italy back in the, you know, late 1800s, moved to Brooklyn, New York. And, and, and my grandfather, he was born in Brooklyn. He married a woman from England, and, and, and that's my people. And, and my people are the, the Jays. They, you know, they came here in the early 1700s to, guess what, Virginia. <laughs> And they, they traveled around here and lived in the States all the way up into the late 1800s. They were Quakers, and some of them moved up into Canada, and that, that, that's my people. And they say, no, but who are your people here in Savannah? And of course, I'm talking old Savannians asking me these questions, right? I didn't know how to answer it. So one day I'm out having lunch with my good friend Tom Hines. And some of y'all remember good old Tom. Tom was a good leader in this church. Tom was a, a good husband to Gail. Having lunch, probably barbecue with a side of fried chicken. <laughs> and I said, Tom, what do people mean when they say, who are your people? He said, well, they're looking to see where your status is in the community. I said, what do you mean my status? Well, you know, if, if you've got a good name, you're up here, somewhere on the, the higher on the, the higher rungs on the ladder of status. And if, if you don't have such a good name, you're down here somewhere else. And I said, I don't, quite, I don't quite get that. He said, well, you have to understand, after the Civil War in the South, people lost a lot. They lost land, they lost wealth and affluence and power. But you know what they didn't lose? They didn't lose the family good name, the good name of the family. See, if you were a person uh, before the Civil War who had wealth and power and status and you were up here, well, you might have lost the wealth and power and everything, but you kept the good name, so you retained your status in the community. And if before the Civil War you didn't have land and wealth and power, and well, your family name was already down there somewhere on the bottom of the, the, the status ladder, and, after the Civil War, and you're wearing an earring and you're playing a guitar, that's a little unusual for folks. It's a little outside the norm, particularly the old timers, the newer folks, they, they're not having an issue with that, but some of the old timers. It's really, really important that you don't bring embarrassment to your people. So when they ask who your people are, they want to know who your people are, where, where you stand on the status ladder, and are you going to embarrass them or not? It's important you don't embarrass them. But look, I, I don't think it's just Southerners. I think to all of us, um, things like social status, public perception, maintaining our place in a social norm and in the, uh, keeping the social pecking order in place or maintaining our place in the community. All of these things are important to us all. All you have to do is think back to the fifth grade or sixth grade when you, you cliques started forming or cliques. I don't know how, how we 
pronounce that in Savannah. When the cliques started forming, who was in and who was out. And if you had Adidas running shoes, you were in the group. If you didn't have Adidas, you couldn't be in the group. Now, my folks, my, my dad was a preacher. My mom was a sometimes uh, uh, early childhood educator. She was always a, an at-home mom. They couldn't afford to be buying their three boys Adidas. They got us the North Stars. And if you remember the North Stars, they were the kind of knockoff of Adidas. They were a lot less of ex expensive, and they only had two stripes, where Adidas had three stripes. <laughs> I guess they were cheaper because you didn't have to put that third stripe on the running shoe. And you know how desperate I was to be in the in-group, to have the right people in the fifth grade? I was so desperate that I took a blue magic marker and I drew a third stripe on my... And I come up to the gang, I say, hey, look, guys, I got... And they look, those aren't Adidas, Bubba. You got yourself North Stars and a magic marker. You're not in the club. I remember the summer before the sixth grade, my mother saw a pair of Adidas in my size on sale. And I got myself some Adidas. And I was so, so excited to have Adidas. I remember the night before the first day of school. I had not worn my Adidas yet. You remember back in grade school, you didn't get to wear your new school clothes until school started. The night before, I slept with those Adidas on the bed right beside my pillow. Let me tell you, you don't sleep with your running shoes next to your pillow after you wear them for a week or two. But, but I was pretty excited because I knew I was going to have my people. When school started up again, unfortunately, my parents moved two months later and went to an entirely different school in a different city where they didn't care anything about Adidas. But the important thing is we had our people. And we had a, our, our pecking order and who belonged to what group. And, and if you were in a certain group, you definitely didn't want to act outside of the norm. You didn't want to bring embarrassment to your people because they'd push you out of the group. I don't think it's fifth grade. I don't think it's the South. I think it's just the way people are sometimes. We want our people. We want our group. We want to know who our people are. And we don't want to embarrass them. In fact, I lived in Cleveland, Ohio on July 8th. 2010. And that date, date might, might not need to mean anything to you, but if you were from Cleveland or you were a basketball fan, that date means a lot. You see, July 8th, 2010 was the day that LeBron James announced that he was leaving Cleveland and going to Miami to win some NBA basketball championships with the Miami Heat. Now, let me tell you, Clevelanders were disappointed to lose their hometown basketball star, LeBron James. He was from Northeast Ohio. Ohioans were banking on LeBron and helping them get a championship back in those days. And they understood LeBron, you know, was going to get traded sooner or later, and they could, they, he's going to go win some championships elsewhere. But what really embarrassed LeBron's people, the people of Northeast Ohio, was the fact that LeBron made his announcement publicly. He dumped the people where they teased and coaxed people 30 minutes into the show before he sat there on stage with the sportscaster and made his announcement, I'm leaving Cleveland. He was leaving his people and he did it in one of the most embarrassing ways you can imagine. He did it publicly in front of 13 million people. People watching down at the Harry Buffalo Sports Bar in downtown Cleveland, a big uh, sports bar on East 4th, ran out into the streets. They made a big pile of LeBron James uh, jerseys and posters, and they set them on fire. And they started trash-talking and bad-mouthing bad -mouthing him. Dan Gilbert, the man who owned uh, and still owns the Cleveland Cavaliers, wrote this scathing letter in the Cleveland Plain Dealer the next day, trash-talking LeBron and saying he was going to take the Cleveland curse with him all the way to Miami. He called him every name in the book. It wasn't just that LeBron was leaving, but he did it publicly. He embarrassed his people. Now, social status, public perception, maintaining place and community, not embarrassing your people. 
They're really, really important to all of us. Well, no wonder, no wonder Jesus' family went out to drag him home. Jesus was bringing embarrassment to his people. Jesus was an embarrassment to his family. They didn't understand what Jesus was doing. Jesus was out there stirring up people with all this God talk. He was performing miracles, and not just performing miracles, he was doing it on the Sabbath. People were starting to gossip about Jesus. See what happens in community when you don't really have the full story? <laughs> we're all too happy to make one up, aren't we? They started gossiping about Jesus. They didn't understand it. The, the, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, they started saying, this Jesus, is, he, he's got the devil in him. Jesus has Beelzebub, the devil. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't hear that word without thinking about Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> Beelzebub has the devil put aside. That's what they called Jesus, Beelzebub. He has Beelzebub. Talk about rumor and gossip. They didn't understand him. They didn't get his religious accent. They say, Jesus, you're not from around here, are you? He has Beelzebub. Now, Jesus, he countered the gossip. He countered the rumors. He came back and said, look, how can the devil cast out the devil? If I've got the devil in me and I'm casting out the devil, I'm casting out myself. They didn't get that. He spoke to them in parables. How can the devil cast out the devil? And still, the gossip continued to spread like wildfire on, through dry grass on a hot summer day. Jesus has lost his mind, his family said. Chapter 3, verse 21 of Mark's gospel says that his family went out to restrain him. That's his family, his kin. They went out to restrain Jesus. You know you're up to... They thought he'd gone off the deep end. And most likely, they were embarrassed that Jesus' behavior was somehow bringing embarrassment to their family, was presenting a problem for his people. When you're dirt poor, like Jesus and his family were, name and reputation and status in the community is everything. Well, look, you have to admit, Jesus was doing some things outside of the social norms of his day, wasn't he? Like I said, we, we kind of get it 2,000 years after the fact. We see it as the pathway to our liberation, our salvation. But at the time, they were scratching their heads and saying, why is Jesus stepping outside the so social norms? He seemed like he was... He was up to, to something that just didn't make sense to many people. And in the end, Jesus did something that's with us still to this day. He brought the gospel, the good news of God's love for all of us. He brought mercy and forgiveness and reconciliation for us with God. He brought us the promise of eternal life, the Easter promise. And along the way, Jesus redefined what family was, ultimately showing in, or what you think you've done, but you are welcome in the family of God. Now, Jesus says that we have a new family. I like to call it the kingdom of God, not the kingdom. Drop the G and you get kin. The kingdom of God. The family of God is where your kin are now. People were pounding on the door saying, Jesus, your mother, your brothers and sisters are outside. They want, they want to drag you home. They think you've gone off the deep end. They've come to collect you. And Jesus asks this revolutionary question. Who are my brothers? Who are my sisters? Who is my mother? Who are my people? My people are the people who do the will of God. My brothers and my sisters and my mother are those 
who are loving others as I have loved people. They are the people who are bringing God's mercy and forgiveness into the world. They are the ones who are bringing water to the thirsty, food to the hungry. Who are my brothers and sisters and my mother? Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. In Christ's kingdom movement, Family is no longer defined by blood. It is now defined by our faith. Being a member of the kingdom of God is not defined by your blood, how big your house is. It doesn't matter whether you've got Adidas or North Stars. Your status in the kingdom of God has to do with your relationship with God. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter whether you are white or black or golden or tan. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter what your accent sounds like. It doesn't matter whether you got an earring or a tattoo. It doesn't matter whether you got straight hair or beautiful curly hair. It just doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what your gender is. I'm so proud of the Presbyterian Church that we've been ordaining women for as long as we have as elders and teaching elders in our tradition. It doesn't matter what your sexual orientation is. It doesn't matter uh, where you stand on the world's uh, uh, strata, the, which rung you're at on the, the ladder of social uh, status or success. No, your people in the kingdom of God are those who are doing the will of God with you. If you, if you ever get asked who your people are, just say, my people, my people are Jesus. My people are, are the brothers and sisters of Jesus. My people are the, the people who are doing the will of God in the world. You know, many years ago, I was in Ontario, Canada, and it was a wonderful congregation, very much like this church, a a kind of a a mixed bag of people from all over the city and and all sorts of background. And God was, like this church, kind of making us one in the ecclesia, in the gathered body of Jesus. I don't remember where she came from, but there was a woman who found her way to our church a woman who'd had some really tough times in her life. She was a recovering heroin and crack addict. She was an ex-prostitute, sustaining her addiction uh, through that kind of behavior. Uh, She didn't look like the rest of us. She dressed in the clothes that she had, which were, if you know what I mean, kind of working clothes. But she'd found her way to the kingdom of God by the power of the Spirit. And she'd been worshiping with us for two or three weeks, maybe four weeks, and we came to a communion Sunday, just like today here at Montgomery. And in that church, when you have communion, the pastor delivers the invitation. I invite all who are seeking to live in the way of Jesus Christ to come and share in this feast, for it has been prepared for you through him who loves you. Jesus Christ. And then we sing a hymn, a communion hymn. And as we sing that hymn, the elders, the servers, the communion servers come forward and they sit in the front pew and they wait until I consecrate the elements and then bring the trays. This woman who's new to the kingdom of God sees people standing up and coming to the front of the church and she thinks to herself, Oh my goodness, this is what we probably need to do. And so she stands up and she takes her six-year-old daughter's hand uh, and, and they march down the center aisle of the church following the servers. 
Nobody else in the congregation moves. There's two or 300 people there that day. And everybody's turn and they start looking at this woman who's coming down the center aisle wearing a very short skirt and fishnet stockings and spiky heels. And some people squirm in their pews and begin to whisper to one another. Some say, who does she think she is? And others start saying, oh my gosh, somebody should stop her. She's going to embarrass herself. I'm up in the, the chancel watching this and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, we should have let her know what our custom was before communion. And the servers sit down in the front pew and she sits down with her little girl right beside him. And I see one of our elders do something very tender. I didn't know what our elder said to her until after the service. But what she'd done is she'd taken one hand and put it around this woman's shoulder. She took her other hand and held this woman's hand. And she whispered in her ear, she said, honey, in just a moment, we're all gonna go up there and get some trays. You wait here and I'm gonna serve you first. You're now part of our family. When I heard that, I thought, that's what it is to be a part of the kingdom of God than us, who may not understand our customs, but it's to make them feel as if they belong, to make them feel as if they've got a home, to make them feel like they're wearing Adidas, even if they got North Stars with a, a blue magic marker stripe on the side, so that when people ask them who their people are, they can join us and say, our people are the people of God. Our people are the people of Jesus. Our people are the people who are doing the will of God in this world. You know, there's a song we sing in this church, and I can't help but think about it when I think about the kingdom of God. We are known in this world not by our social status, not by who the prettiest girl in class is or the smartest boy or the strongest, fastest person on the football team. We're known not by the running shoes we wear or don't wear. We are known by this world by our love. You know the song, and it goes like this. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Who are my people? You're my people. God bless you all. Amen.